Good to have you all back for another episode, which happens to be our 235th, and you are about to be our 12,500th viewer, so thank you for that. We're broadcasting live from, if you would drill through our planet, then you would get the both ends of it, and that is back in Honolulu, Hawaii, in your Bishop Museum, DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Good morning or good day, everybody. All right, and me on the other drilling end, uh, would you wish so back near Munich, Germany, uh, your host, uh, your co-host Martin Despain. Okay, uh, so the last time we, we took a break, we stayed on one slide, which is the one at the very bottom right here, because we just had to clear our minds and, and brainstorm about uh, the unbelievable situation that little did we know uh, on the top right, some few weeks ago, we were listing here the three, which we thought the most uh, challenges of, of uh, we should say, womankind, because it was Women Day some days ago, and, um, and children kind and, uh, and mankind, which was, of course, still the COVID coronavirus, then climate change and civility. We were thinking civility as far as social equity and increasing struggle for dwelling in dignity and giving shelter to people. And little did we know that it would be basically um, uh, in brackets, the crime of humanity, what's been done to people in the Ukraine right now. And that was is extremely tough and it's ongoing. And so um, we've been using uh, as whenever we need uh, fresh, uh, a fresh view. We use automobiles and cars as sometimes metaphorical vehicles for a thought. So we've been looking and remembering that both of us basically uh, heard about the, the wars of the past and the current when we were in, in cars. And also cars remind us when we pick up at the gas station, you know, they're climbing and climbing the gas prices which shouldn't be the primary problem. The primary problem is people dying there. Children and women and men are dying there and that's the worst. But once we get into this routine of, of life, which psychologists even tell us, we should of course you know, update us as often as possible with what's going on and be empathetic and trying to help in, in most possible ways, but we should also stay on track to not making it drive us crazy, right? But yeah. the gas stations is a reminder because that immediately makes us remember where that comes from, from our dependency on fossil fuel. And when we were saying, you know, I was going to skiing, then, you know, next time I should go taking a train because there's actually a train going there, kind of coming full circle to, as we know, the beginning of my professional prototyping, which was tram stations for the expo in 2000 so many years ago right now. So kind of reconnecting to that. Also my buddy Dan, with whom I you know, heard about the, uh, uh, the Iraq war, the Gulf war, uh, these uh, 30 years ago, he then came back and visited me in Germany. And this reminds us of that there's been wars here in, in Europe before, because at that time there was the Yugoslavian war and wars, and he is, uh, his parents are first um, generation immigrants. And he wanted to get um, his grandma out and he uh, rented and didn't let the rental company know a Beamer, a BMW and drove there and had to return unsuccessfully, which made him very sad because per the old saying, an old, uh, an old tree, you don't replant, right? So we can only imagine how tough it must be for people to leave their home. I actually had um, contact with uh, the first Ukrainian when I was on uh, the train station here where I booked my train ticket to see Joe and Lenny uh, over spring break. And there was a young woman there, who, her app uh, had Ukrainian you know, uh, language on there and she wanted to know how to get to, which turned out to be the embassy location there. And I was able to um, you know, give her direction to that one. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's close to us in, in so many different ways. And again, the New York Times feature at the bottom left, um, again, cars, just like architecture, are supposed to give us safety, security, independence. But in this case here, as the picture points out, the opposite, and even more so what the Star Advertiser about a week ago now already, or several days ago, was uh, picking from World Press here, which shows that 
bullet shattered glass looking out into the Ukrainian uh, horizon there with snow on the roofs. And, and DeSoto, you said, uh, you know, we had our um, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who we quote quite a bit, just speak to us, you know, Germans and Europeans and saying we should try to get off fossil fuel as frantically fast as we can. And they're thinking about mandating uh, PV on the roofs for every new building. Um, but they also urge uh, what we say always cut down consumption and to the consumers and, you know, turn down your temperature of your furnace a little bit. I'm doing this here with my puffy jacket, put something warmer on, because if anyone would do that, we, you know, all together, we have an impact because every drip of oil, 35% of the oil we consume here, and we don't have any oil whatsoever in Germany here, not worth mentioning, 35% comes from Russia. Uh, the gas is 50% comes from there. So try to get off that is the utmost mission. And you just said to me uh, before the show, what the soda about turning down the furnace. Well, again, we as we keep saying, we here in the Hawaiian Islands are in an extremely privileged position where we do not need heating. And personally, I'm very grateful for that because I get cold very easily. And if I had to go through winter with a thermostat way down so that it was cold indoors and cold outdoors, I would be very unhappy. I'm lucky that I don't have to do that. And all of us here in the Hawaiian Islands don't, so have, don't have to do that either. So the impact of energy on us is far reduced compared to the great majority of people in the northern hemisphere who live where it's cold yeah and 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 everything that happens you know is impacting unfortunately the ones at the bottom of the food chain the poor people right uh, ukraine is one prime wheat chamber of the world and it will triple and trickle through to africa where the already starving will be more and more they don't have anything to do directly with that but the beast of globalism that we don't want to condemn but it's dark side you know just really shows at this point trying to keep yeah. the spirit and i up. just i just yeah. read that uh, the U ukraine has just pro uh, prohibited uh, food exports because they need it for themselves. So as exactly. you just said, they're cutting off food for people thousands of miles away on the planet that have nothing to do with this, and yet they're forced to do so. Yeah, yeah. So the main target areas, which we did a couple of shows about because of this potential exchange we're promoting between me here in Germany and, and back in Hawaii was, again, uh, habitation, was nutrition, was transportation, and was education. These are the four areas that we need to really target. And so uh, that being said, again, we took the emerging generation to keep the spirit up, uh, bottom right, the show quote to the utmost, um, you know, innovative projects here in Munich that try to make ends meet from an economical side, because we had this issue before and it's just worsening the situation. And then we have the architect, Peter, uh, Heimel here, who is doing this beehive project that is using innovative technologies besides the innovative, um, you know, uh, sort of collapsing uh, circulation and habitation beehive system. He's using uh, ultralight concrete, which we should introduce to the island because it insulates. And he's also introducing or using prefab, which we have out there at very specific Rocky Mountain precast. So, Peter, we want your building. Uh, we want you on the island here. And talking emerging generation, the next slide, while, you know, speaking about myself, DeSoto, old, uh, old fart fogies uh, have our opinion after careful consideration. But here is joining us the emerging generation. This is Derek Correa, who is usually, we're talking that Ursula also, um, you know, pulls back from the past of my childhood in the 70s where we had this car-free Sunday, you know, where we try to demonstrate we can do without fossil transportation. She's trying to bring that back. Uh, Derek was always doing that greatly on the island because he's always on a skateboard that he actually built himself. So it's a double win-win situation. Um, and this here, he obviously, uh, exception to the world, might have been in his car because you see these reflections there. And let us basically recall his assessment of the Koola project. Right. And he, he first of all was talking about planters at the bottom left, you see 
these planters that he said, well, hopefully they're planting plants in there. We said, this is nice, but it's not new, right? The gateway project we show on top there on number one is from the early nineties. Look as silly how we looked at there and that's how the building is as silly, but it has planters. And then our friend Lon Lindgren, who we're missing today, basically uh, this is the, uh, at the very uh, top right on the number three, I guess it is, um, we have, what he called building smothered with green. And that was how the Ihilani was supposed to be. He got, got very engineered here as his project architect, his colleague and friend, Larry Stricker, telling us in that show that he pl had this plan for every floor, then it got very engineered. Now only every other one has it. And the uh, four season people are not even able to manage to have plants in there as of now. So that's pretty bad. Also, what Derek was criticizing is painting concrete. That's something we've been bringing up as a problem. Why painting concrete, right? So these are things he was disappointed about. And getting to the next slide, please, that's one you took, DeSoto. Uh, you wanted to make sure to say you stopped at that red light there, right? When you that's right. I was, I was stopped at the red light in the left turn lane. So no, I was not doing anything dangerous when I took this photograph out of my car and I wasn't, I wasn't about to call, cause a car crash. Yeah. And this is good teamwork because I think this extra image illustrates pretty well what summarizes Derek's um, assessment because he called the building basically underwhelming. Right, so there's a certain disappointment that he said it was promising to be sugar cane, but then all things considered that we basically talked about. And a little hard to see, but if you go really, if you would go up close, you see that they actually started at the top floors and that gets us to the next slide uh, to do something that we've been saying one should condemn on the islands, you know, abandoned, which is glass guardrails, but here they are. And what does this have to do? This is very provocative because, you know, some shows ago at the very top left, we we're looking uh, in Frankfurt at the newest trends and we saw Bjarke Ingels uh, somehow doing something kind of sarcastic because it reminded us of a plane having maybe flown into the building and dented it. And so while that was supposed to be funny somehow, haha, -ha, not really. But then one of the first images that was getting viral around the world is what we see at the very bottom left. And that's not funny at all. That was a rocket basically hitting one of the residential towers uh, here in Kiev. So what in the world does this have to do with paradise, right? Where we're so remote, where hopefully we don't have any of these problems. Well, we have, because we're talking fossil fuel is in the center of all of that. And yes, you so perfectly wrapped up last time, DeSoto, you said we're using way too much fossil fuel in Hawaii, where we, where we have a chance to use as little as possible if we would only build as your ancestors have been doing that pretty successfully because they had no other chance because that was pre-contact and oil was a strange and foreign unknown thing, right? Yep. We also and nobody was talk, using oil anywhere in the world at that point. We had no oil-based anything. Oil came out of the ground and nobody used it for anything. Yeah. And now we cannot live without it. Exactly. And let's, you know, Max was just sympathetic before the show and said he's continuing or he's talking with buddies about the topic of lanai's and easy breeziness. Let's throw in for further differentiation the terminology of a loggia, right? And Correct. how do we look at these lanai's differently when we think about the, the more suitable terminology of logia, right? Well, well, that word, as you sent to me, actually means a build or a room which is open on at least one side, usually to a garden. Obviously, that's in a one-story building. Uh, in this case, what we're, is this truly a loggia? Because yes, it's open on one side if you open the doors so that you've got sliding doors there, but is it truly open if it has this additional extra low wall of a glass guardrail? Because there's that is then doing not very much to increase your air circulation. And that's one of the crucial things that we've got to do here is circulate air particularly because we have trade winds much of the time that do that for us and essentially air condition us if we are open to it, if we build structures that will take advantage of it. Yeah, so when you carve out, when you subtract 
uh, versus add as cantilevering lanai's as we did a show about then um, again the, the logia definition is you got to be open to at least one side and that's all you get here because you're actually close to after all five sides if you add the top and the bottom of your slab and all the other three sides and then as you said you already limit your one open exposure by keeping the guardrail closed you're pretty much hermeticizing yourself the the lanai and it's less of a lanai anymore and then also telling here you see these uh, ashamed curtains that they put behind that corner glass that we talked about that gets hit by the sun uh, all the time so these are all things you know nature doesn't do and nature would then get dehydrated and basically dry up and die right if this would be a plant that it aims to be one next slide uh, this is per uh, basically another point that Derek brought up, right? Yeah. So what we have here is the exterior um, crane support that's helping to construct this building. And as you can see, it's got a support that actually sticks into one of those rooms where they have not yet installed the glass on the corner. And you said that Derek was saying, well, wouldn't it be cool if this was an exterior uh, elevator shaft? And no, it's not going to be. This is just something that's sort of temporary. But when, it, when we look at the, at the room plan, which is right there on the screen as that skinny uh, drawing is, we do see that at least there is a crossway uh, corridor that does going that does go to the outside. So there is light coming in from either side to light that interior corridor. So it's not quite pitch black if the electricity goes off. However, <clears throat> pardon me, it's still not as innovative as our favorite Ala Moana building. And that's what we see at the picture at the very top. That was built in 1961. And it had this extremely innovative exterior of vertical louvers or slats, which moved, pivoted at different times of the day to help keep the interior of the building cooler by shading the building as the sun moved. This was extremely innovative for the time, and the building as a whole, as a whole was very innovative with the Laurent rotating restaurant at the top as well, which was the first rotating restaurant in the entire United States. So we were, there was a time when we were very innovative. There was a time when we were doing things outside of the norm, and this is performative exterior structures. This is a performative thing. It's not purely decorative. It isn't just doing it for fun. It actually makes a difference, which now, unfortunately, we don't see, even though we're now in the 21st century. But in this building here, making it maybe even worse, we pretend to do, right? But it could, uh... Yeah. And again, this sort of side-lit corridor of where the elevator shafts are is what the Alamoana building had as well, some half of a century ago. But then as you perfectly put it, it also had this sort of biokinetic feathery cold that open and closed, right? So this is so much way more Hawaiian, right? Your ancestors would have loved that embrace and say, hey, that's like us just here and now, right? <laughs> Well, the other one is more pretending. So once again, um, ladies and gentlemen, what, what are we doing? And, and again, this is not a boutique architect way back. John Graham was the most commercial architect. So that was mainstream, but he came to Hawaii and he said, oh man, I got to do better than anywhere else. So again, yeah. Jeannie is sort of, you know, a boutique architect and at and, and that point that wasn't even. So that makes it even more questionable. Right. So let's right. sort of spend the, the second half of this year um, with uh, a polemic uh, uh, positive proposition. Next slide, because uh, they dedicate this little, we said careful to call it park, but it's a green strip uh, just outside of the building. And they plant the tree that gives the least shade, which is the palm tree, but it's good enough for these people. So you got this, you know, example of raw model nature right out there. And next slide. While the top part is basically then how the Kula basically fits in. And after all, you know, things considered and carefully, um, you know, um, reflected, we have to say, although the building tries to look more interesting, but on a performative level, as you said, it's um, insufficiently better than its very fossil neighbors here, which is very sort of disappointing. 
and to lift the spirit up at the bottom is a proposition together with the emerging generation of a different uh, nature of the beast, as we call them primitivas three that would grow uh, out of the ground and uh, next slide. Uh, while at the top left, uh, Primitiva 1 in the evolution, we could call, looking back, probably a hollow elephant leg, but still pretty clumsy. Um, at the uh, picture number 2 at the top right, which is Primitiva 2, which is more like a flamingo leg, trying to balance on that one. But now uh, with Primitiva 3 at the bottom right, we uh, rediscover more indigenous uh, materials in a very innovative way because we are a volcanic island. So there's basalt and basalt you can make into ropes and cables with a strength that is superior to steel. How does that sound? And it doesn't rust. Exactly, yeah. So wouldn't your ancestors have not just loved but used that if they would have had the technology yes. and granted so, of course, you need to set up an industry to make that. These don't grow on trees, but you have you got the material there on the island. So you just got to process it into that one. Mm -hmm. And next slide uh, is showing us the emergent generation in doing that, just having one compression mass to the to the left for uh, gravity. And then using what uh, Bucky Fuller with his Kaiser Dome that he left us with that unfortunately, just like the feathery screen of the Alamoana building is not anymore. They stole it from us and we need it back. And they were just adding then what Bucky Fuller called tensegrity to that one. And next slide, let's share some potential sites for that DeSoto. Well, as you can see, as, as you just said, this, this has its own structure, which sort of supports itself. And it's one really big, long, continuous spiral. And so it's a very simple thing. Well, one of the sites that we would love to see this in is the un, now underutilized site, which formerly had the Ward Plaza structure on it, which we admired as a concrete, small concrete, uh, brutalist building from 1969 which had a lot to, in its credit and a lot in its favor. It was unfortunately and somewhat paradoxically demolished, even though it was still a completely functional building. The site is empty at the moment. So why not put one of these Primitiva 3s on it in counterpoint, shall we say, to all of the other large, boxy, unoriginal and not particularly exciting structures which are being built in that site right now by the Howard Hughes Corporation. Yeah, absolutely. And and that one, uh, the one we see here is actually just one over, but same thing, uh, Steve Owl, that was Ward Warehouse. This is where they want to build the Victoria Place. We've been reporting about another Solomon Cortwell Buens, Chicago-based firm, hermetic refrigerator that if we run out of oil to power it, it becomes a microwave. And next slide is that location just over of formerly Ward Plaza you were talking about. And next slide, yes. um, if we zoom in into the top right image there, when Jeannie basically was proposing in this diagrammatic way, if we can get zoom into the top right image there, um, that the, the, the basically the bathroom and the kitchen would be connected to the corridor. And she was branding that as something innovative. We said, no, this is rebranding. This is the same old mid-century, uh, excuse me, 20th century, uh, mid-century way we've been building hotels and apartment buildings. They're not easy breezy because double loaded corridor is not. But in Primitiva 3, as you see on the big picture here, we, we zone it from outside in. We keep the water where the water is. And then there is a green zone behind that lives off the water. And then there is the dry zone where the people live on the other side. And on the next slide, this is then basically bringing what Hawaii is all about, bringing the jungle and the beach into the building. And is this just weird? Is that just utopian? Next and final slide, you tell me, DeSoto. No, and actually this is something which is uh, very relevant for us today because 
Today we are facing in Honolulu house, hundreds and hundreds of high rises, of residential high rises, which do not have sprinklers for fire protection. We saw a calamity that er occurred several years ago in the Marco Polo condominium fire in which four people died and hundreds and hundreds of departments were damaged. So our friend, the retired fire chief, of course, would appreciate the Primitiva 3, which is it's circled and in, encased in a water curtain. And here's a demonstration of how that water curtain could function with an over a pipe overhead, nozzles at intervals, and always there's falling water there. That means you've always got water there. You're always protected from fires. Not only that, but the structure of itself does not lend itself to catch on fire anyway, because it doesn't contain small contained areas which lead to catastrophic fires. Yeah, and this is further investigated here by Dustin Chang, who I had the privilege and honor to work with on his The Arc project at our School of Architecture. He was a collaborator on Primitiva 2 already and then further developed this more in real scale with a sort of mock-up prototype testing uh, apparatus furthermore, and uh, we will continue to do that. Yeah, and our tropical tutor, Bill, hi Bill, basically lives in the Marco Polo. His mother used to until very close, uh, high age as your mother is, still is luckily, and, and he's now, he took over the place and is living there as he, so he knows very well about. And again, Hawaiian News now uh, at the top right is reporting that now code wants to mandate that for, for all the high rises. And yes, Socrates was always very supportive, not to say enthusiastically appreciative about these um, you know, alternative ways that we were proposing. Uh, to reconnect to uh, the um, basically indigenous um, um, mindset while using uh, modern here and now cutting edge technologies. So with that, um, we're at the end of the show. Uh, we will uh, continue to look at the newest developments as uh, hard as it is at times, as you can tell. And so we'll use the next couple of shows looking into an area talking about the Ella Moana building, actually how things develop around the Ella Moana building, which they call Midtown in a very promising way. So we will look into that, stay tuned for that. And until then, please stay easy breezy and breezily easy as to save our world. Bye bye. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.